So it's a well-known uh, sort of distinction that we can make in the sort of history of politics or political theory to um, to mark the change between how the ancient Greeks conceived of the difference between a civilized Greek-speaking person and a barbaric person. Um, it wasn't a, a distinction made based on the color of someone's skin or where they were born. It's a what we might call a cultural distinction. Um, I'm going to use that category now, but I'm going to uh, problematize it later. It's a cultural distinction such that a barbaric person can become civilized by learning the, the Greek language and adopting the practices, political and, and religious, of a, of a given city-state. So you can become civilized. The more contemporary, um, let's say, Euro-American understanding of the difference between races between a white person and a black person, say, or a red person, um, is that distinction is made differently. Um, it's racialized, meaning it's placed in the realm of biology and nature rather than cultural, and there's no way to biologically change your race, right? That's, that's how moderns would conceive of, of this difference. Um, it's a nature-culture uh, it assumes a nature-culture division that wasn't there for the Greeks. Um, for the Greeks, culture is what human beings naturally uh, strive to, to grow into, right? Culture isn't somehow an imposition upon nature. It's not free-floating. In the modern period, we've um, created a... we've bifurcated nature and culture. And this leads to all sorts of confusions when in, in the realm of political discourse we try to sort out historical injustices related to race or to gender or sexuality um, because we end up with this very postmodern understanding of culture as if it's just uh, free-floating signifiers um, self-defining a bunch of self-defining signs with no rootedness um, in a biological matrix or a physiochemical um, reality that, that, that transcends culture. Now, anyone who knows anything about you know, my philosophical orientation knows that I'm not trying to reduce, I would never reduce what we think of as culture and consciousness, um, human subjectivity to, to nature or biology. I'm not a um, sociobiologist. Uh, or an evolutionary psychologist, I think those are pseudosciences, ultimately, based on just so stories and a very oversimplified understanding of um, and literalized uh, understanding of Darwinian natural selection as the sole source of cultural collection uh, selection. Because again, this whole nature-culture dichotomy, this mind-matter dualism, um, leads to confusions like, you know, the question of race. We generally um, in the popular way of talking about race, whether it's the neo-fascist white supremacists championing white rights, um, or whether it's just your average kind of centrist, liberal, or you know, somewhat conservative person who wants to just keep saying all lives matter, or whether it's um, a Black Lives Matter activist, say a white ally, who's championing the cause, um, who's, who's thinking of whiteness or of blackness as the property of a substance, um, rather as something that inheres in the substance of a person, of a person's being, rather than the alternative to thinking of race as a property of a substance is thinking of race as a, as a process of relationship uh, or a relational process. It's, there are processes of racialization which occur, wherein to become white necessarily, intrinsically means uh, to other blacks. That something about the nature of white ident identity implies um, usually an unconscious, sometimes a conscious um, subjugation of blacks. To think of oneself as white is to think of oneself as better than the black people. To think of oneself as black, similarly in America, it's a relational process in the sense that to be black is to be subjugated, subjugated by whites. To have internalized uh, 
this white gaze and this sense of, you know, so we're both in this traumatic bind, whites and blacks. Um, and so to think of whiteness as the substance of a property that exists entirely on its own over here and blackness as the substance of the property of this other substance over here is to ignore these processes of racial, racialization, historical uh, processes um, that are social in nature, right? We're not atomized individuals who belong to self-constituting, you know, like auto uh racial categories. We're just not. And so when it's not that I'm saying race is a social construct, um, I'm saying that everything is a social construct. Uh, and that what it means to be a social construct is not to be made up by the power structures in the present, but to be a part of a long evolutionary process where there's something creative going on in the present always, but there's also um, an inheritance of the momentum of the past that is in many ways inescapable and that shapes what's possible. So not everything is possible in the present. And so some forms of, I think, utopian progressivism become unrealistic and saw the branch off that they're standing on uh, because they there's a certain historical momentum we have to um, heal the trauma as it exists and not pretend like we could turn it off immediately in the present and healing is not easy uh, because it's not just a matter of white people atoning for their sins or, uh, white people filming themselves admitting uh, their privilege, expressing their sorrow, promising to be to behave differently as individuals. I mean, certainly, there is an element of um, metanoia, of religious uh, conversion to waking up to, to racism. But you know, these videos I'm seeing of of white people um, engaging in these self-flagellation uh, rituals is not helping black people. It's centering white suffering, again, uh, ignoring black suffering, while it's the pretense to paying attention to black suffering. Um, it's a process that to me feels all too uh, internalized within the white subject. These people are still thinking of themselves, of their whiteness as the property of a substance rather than a process of racialization um, so that anything we're going to do to heal the racial injustices in our country and the collective trauma that has led to these injustices, is, it's going to require more than just individuals atoning for their sins. It's going to require looking at our social, economic, especially our economic institutions, and seeing how race and class are inseparable. I mean, you, you can't have... Um, a purely class-based analysis that totally ignores the idea of race, just as you can't have purely race-based analysis that ignores class. These categories depend on one another for to even have any meaning. Um, so, there, so when I say that everything is socially constructed, I'm coming from a perspective wherein like, my body is a society of cells, and the habits that these cells have inherited are pretty stable. Um, you know, my body knew how to grow, grow from a zygote into uh, an infant, into an adolescent, an adult form um, because of inherited habits, genes we call them, the genetic code, which is really a network of molecular relationships in the context of an environment um, that, that fosters a certain um, pattern being brought forth reliably. And that pattern that's brought forth reliably, reliably is not something that I can think my way out of. It's not something that, um, you know, I can just will to be different. Now, on the other hand, there are certain biotechnologies now where, you know, for example, um, those born as men can transition into being um, female gendered and vice versa those born female can become male gendered. Uh, now, of course, this is equivocating on the meaning of gender and sex, and I think, again, we don't want to bifurcate nature and culture here while still acknowledging, I think, a difference in the um, 
level at which habits can be circumvented. Biological habits are really like in place, like chromosomes and the hormonal um, balances that they regulate uh, are, are inherited and they're just there. We don't get to decide how they operate. We can take um, exogenous, like we can you know ingest hormones to alter the balance um, and we could even eventually maybe kind of surgically alter the nature of our chromosomes and our, our genes through CRISPR technologies and other things. But um, I think this is a, a form of hyper nature rather than a sense of some kind of um, transcendent technology reaching into nature from beyond nature. Um, you know, human beings are granted a form of hyper nature. And our culture allows for habits to be changed rather more um, rapidly than biological habits have been able to evolve in the past. We can learn within the span of a single lifetime rather than it taking generations as for, you know, other life forms without the intensity of, um, of consciousness that human beings possess. They learn more slowly. We learn more quickly. And our cultures can transform more quickly than nature seems to. And yet, as we're learning with the ecological crisis, um, our culture cannot exist independently of and always has uh, an effect upon the biophysical environment within which it exists, within which it grows. Um, and so our human processes of uh, social reproduction are entirely embedded within, completely inseparable from the Earth's uh, biophysical processes. We can't think of these as two separate uh, substances, you know, as Descartes would have, would ha would have it. Uh, and so when we think about race, I think I'm trying to invite us to not reify it into an identity, a fixed identity, the property of a substance, but rather to think of it as a relational process with with a historical genealogy and when we think of gender similarly and sex um, there's a biological dimension to sex uh, and we cannot just impose our own cultural categories on biology at the same time that whatever cultural categories we may come up with these are expressions of our own um, biological capacities, right? Uh, we can alter our sex technologically and that opens up a whole new, a brave new world, if you will, a whole new horizon for the future course of evolution. There's all sorts of ethical quandaries that are raised by the power that technology now has as a form of hyper nature uh, to transform itself. That's the human uh, problem. That is why we are now in the Anthropocene, because we have to uh, become conscious of this connection rather than imagining that somehow we human beings uh, were parachuted into this world from elsewhere and that we're only here temporarily um, undergoing some sort of trial at the end of which we will be judged and those who perform well are chosen to, to go back to, to heaven. That, under, that cosmology, I think, is um, part of why we live in such times of such turmoil. And uh, maybe philosophy can help us just to have a different kind of conversation. Um, it can help us realize the real freedom that we have to compose the world differently uh, with one another. But we need to be able to communicate. And I fear that lines of communication are breaking down and that... Uh, 
our language is becoming balkanized and we're just talking past one another falling into these patterns of reaction that um, are rooted in trauma totally understandable and um, forced they're, they're leading us to spin our wheels and we have a real opportunity I think right now to break through into a new way of understanding who and what we are as human beings as members of a, of a community of life on a living planet. Uh, if only we could recognize our shared sense um, of destiny, we could do some really amazing things together. <laughs>